praise every honor, every glory, every adoration. Turn to your neighbor and say, the word of God is quick and powerful. It will set me free and give me victory. So I open my heart and I will receive the word. If you believe it, put your hands together for the king one more time. Amen. And so, Father, I testify again that Jesus heals and Jesus saves. I thank you for the privilege to preach your word again. Please stretch forth your hand to heal and to save, comfort the afflicted, and encourage the weak. Holy Spirit, please rest upon me as I lift up my Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ, on this resurrection Sunday morning. Can we put our hands together for the King? Amen. And let's thank the, the praise and worship team for the wonderful ministration this morning. We thank the Lord, amen. You may be seated. The story is told of um, an incident in the life of Charles Lamb. Charles Lamb was uh, a famous literary uh, figure in London. And he said at one time when uh, Charles Lamb was with uh, several other men of letters and geniuses of literature, he began to speak of what they would do if great men of the past uh, suddenly, you know, uh, walked in and, uh, you know, appeared in a doorway. And so this, this generated a lot of uh, discussions. And one of them remarked that if Shakespeare, we all know Shakespeare was a great, uh, you know, genius of literature. And so one of them said if Shakespeare were to come in, they would all stand in respect of who uh, he is. And uh, someone also remarked that, but if Jesus Christ should appear, they will all kneel down in worship and adoration. You see, Jesus is no ordinary person. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is before all things, and Jesus is above all things. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 9 to 11, the Bible says, Therefore, God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the mention of of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can we just rise up one more time on this Easter Sunday morning? Just rise up one more time and give the Lord Jesus Christ a wonderful sounding ovation. Amen. <laughs> for all that Jesus has done for you, we give him a wonderful clap of hand this morning. Let's thank the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's thank our Savior. Let's thank our Redeemer. He's our help from ages past. Put your hands here for him. Jesus is the ancient of days. He's the bright and the morning star. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated, please. Death could not hold Jesus. We celebrate today because Jesus is alive. Jesus has conquered death and he's given us hope for tomorrow. And that's why we sing the song, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Because He Lives, all fear is gone because I know who holds my future and life is worth living because Jesus is alive. Amen? You see, Christianity is the only religion that offers an atoning savior. A savior who forgives our sins and saves our souls. A savior with whom we can have a personal relationship. Every other religious leader was a teacher, but not a savior. Jesus is the only religious teacher who died and rose again to offer forgiveness for our sins and also eternal life to those who believe in him. And that is the radical difference between Christianity and every other religion. Now today I want to talk about the meaning of Easter. What is the meaning of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Why are we rejoicing so much this morning? Why, why are our spirits high? Why, why have we come to church this morning full of joy? What is the meaning of the death and the resurrection of Jesus? Please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 28. And I want to look at the first uh, six verses. The Bible says, after the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene. Now, Mary Magdalene was an interesting woman because she's a woman out of whom Jesus cast seven devils. Thank God for our women. Amen? So Mary Magdalene and the other women went out to look at the tomb. 
There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and then sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white like snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he is risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Come and see the irrefutable evidence that Jesus is alive. And so Jesus is not here. He is risen from the, de- from the dead. The grave is empty. The tomb is empty. And so what is the meaning of all this? I want us to start by tracing the journey from the cross to the empty tomb. The Bible tells us in Matthew 26 that after his last supper with his disciples, Jesus went with them to the garden of Gethsemane. And the crowd led by Judas was sent to, to arrest him. And Jesus was taken to the palace uh, of the high priest where the religious leaders gathered to look for false evidence just so they could put him to death. And finally, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ? And Jesus answered, yes, I am the Christ. And so from that point on, Jesus was charged with blasphemy and they wanted to put him to death. And so they mocked him, they spat on him, they struck him, they put a crown of thorns on his head. Even Peter, his closest friend, his closest disciple, denied him three times. Peter cares and he said, I don't know this Jesus. And this is the same Peter, by the way, who had promised that if everyone forsake Jesus, he wasn't going to forsake Jesus. He was going to die with Jesus. But he denied Jesus. You see, we can make all kinds of promises, but for the grace of God, we won't be able to keep any of those promises. May God help us to be promise keepers. Amen? The next stop was the governor's palace. The governor found Jesus to be innocent. Even Jesus, uh, Judas, the betrayer, knew that Jesus was innocent. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew 27, look at 3 and 4, the Bible says, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. And so Judas ended up actually committing a suicide. Listen, Satan has nothing good to offer you. He will only entice you, he will use you, and then he will abandon you. So never give the enemy a photo of the man. Now, even though Jesus was innocent, the governor came in to pressure from the crowd, and he ordered that Jesus uh, should be crucified. And so Jesus was crucified almost naked. I want you to picture this. When you think of the crucifixion, think of the fact that Jesus was almost crucified naked on the cross and, and with his mother and his disciple John looking on. His enemies were happy. The passers-by taunted him. The soldiers mocked him. Even one of the thieves on the cross insulted him and said, if you are the Christ, then save yourself and save us also. And to the Christ. The worst of humanity came out against the sinless son of God. The people who are fed, the people who are healed, they all came out insulting him as he was led to the cross and as he hung on the cross. But what was the response of Jesus even to that? The Bible says, Jesus simply says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Listen, no matter what they said against you, no matter what is done against you, always remember the image of Jesus on the cross. Forgive and let God fight your every battle for you because you do that, amen? Always glorify God with your responses. Remember the image of Jesus on the cross and how he responded to even to the, the, the insults that he was receiving. The Bible says that from 12 noon to 3 p.m., Darkness came over the land, and Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The father had turned his back away from Jesus because Jesus was at that point in time taking on all the sins of humanity. God's sinless son was made sin for us. And Jesus said, into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit, and he gave up the spirit. And then he cried out, it is finished. It is finished. 
have taken away the sins of humanity. I have reconciled humanity to you, Father. I have destroyed the waste of the devil. I have set humanity free. It is finished. Church, it is finished. The victory has been won. It is finished. Can we put our hands together for the king? Amen. It is finished. And so the question is, why did Jesus go through all that pain? Why did Jesus suffer and die? The prophet Isaiah provides us with some answers. Isaiah 53, looking at the first five verses, the Bible says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground, out of very difficult circumstances, dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. What's Isaiah saying? Isaiah is simply saying, without divine revelation, who can believe this report? That this man, Jesus, without any beauty, without any majesty, with his rather unimpressive birth, was going to be the savior of the world. Who has believed our report? There was no beauty in him. There was no majesty to, to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should even desire him. You see, appearances can be deceptive. Many times, the blessings of God come in forms and in ways that we might not necessarily desire. Because the Bible says God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. If you go by appearances alone, you might miss God. And verse 3 says, Jesus was despised. He was despised, that means he was hated. And he was rejected by men. A man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. On this Easter Sunday morning, I want to tell you that Jesus understands the pain you're going through. Amen? He was familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. We gave him no value. Jesus was despised and he was rejected. He was thrown out of his own hometown at one point when they went in there wanting to heal and to minister. He was thrown out. And so he was you know, familiar with being rejected. He, he was familiar with, with suffering. He was rejected by his own family when he was alive because they didn't even believe in him. Jesus was not a sin. He was given no value. He was regarded and appraised as a zero. But why did God cause Jesus to suffer? We find the answer in verses 4 and 5. The Bible says in verse 4, Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. And so Jesus carried our sorrows on the cross. And that is why he says in Matthew 16 and 33, In this world you have tribulation, you have trials, you have challenges. But be of good cheer because I've already overcome the world. And then Jesus also says in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary, who are tired, and who are burdened, and I'll give you rest. So Jesus is our burden bearer. And so on this Resurrection Sunday morning, would you allow Jesus to carry your burden? Now these are all benefits of the cross, but that's not the end of it. Listen to verse 5. Verse 5 says, He was pierced for our transgressions, our sins, the things that we do against God. He was Christ for our iniquities, our deliberate sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds or by his stripes we are healed. Jesus was pierced with a spear. He was Christ with our souls. His back was Christ viciously with a whip. And what did that accomplish? Number one, he gave us peace with God. And so today, you and I can go boldly before the throne of grace and we can cry out, Abba, Father. Because we have this relationship, this peace with God. And so there's no more alienation between God and humanity. Second, our sins are forgiven. Our guilt has been washed away. And so, like the woman of the world who was trying to hide from everybody else, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. There's no point in hiding. Church, that is very good news. And so like the woman who was caught in adultery, Jesus is saying, 
listen, I died for you. There's no more condemnation. Everybody else might condemn you, but I do not condemn you. Say, that is very good news. And third, the Bible says, by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. Sickness is one of the most terrible things in life. And that's why Satan was so eager to strike Job with sickness because he said, if I strike Job with sickness, Job will certainly give up his faith in God. But thank God, Job held on. Sickness is costly. It's costly in time. It's costly in money. Sickness is very discouraging. And so sickness is very bad news. But the healing that Jesus brought is good news. And so Isaiah is saying, Jesus provided for our healing by the stripes that he received on his body. And so the Bible tells us in James 5.13 that if any of us are sick, we should call the elders to pray. And the prayer of faith will bring healing. Thank God that Jesus has healed us by his stripes. Amen? And then the Bible also says in Mark 16, Jesus himself said, In my name you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, and by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. What a wonderful blessing from God. In the end, God always wins. He wins over sickness. He wins over disease. May the Lord God Almighty bring you your healing today. Amen. May God bring healing to every situation. Mental healing, emotional healing, physical healing. Whatever form of healing, by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. Can we put our hands together for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Amen. Jesus died. For our moral needs, he gave us a new standard of morality. He died for our spiritual needs. He reconciled us with God. He died for our physical needs. He brought us healing. But dying on the cross was not the end of the story. You see, Jesus was crucified on Friday, but Sunday was coming. The best was yet to come. The crown of thorns that was put on his head was not the end of the story. The crown of glory was yet to come. The resurrection was on the way. Listen, when you feel crucified and buried by your problems, hold on, because the resurrection is coming. Can I have a witness? You know, this week, let me just share a little testimony. You know, this week, I had some very difficult news, some very challenging news. I wasn't expecting that at all. You know, because uh, there's something that I've been working on for a long time, and you know, we, we're getting close to the end and all that. And, you know, I was expecting some very good news. And then, unfortunately, the news turned, turned out to be very challenging. And I said to myself, you know, because my God is alive, I know that the victory will be won the end. Amen? You remember, yes, remember last week, I, I came into church, and during the worship time, uh, I came out and I said, no, the Lord has put on my heart that he will make a way where there was no way. Can I have a witness? And, and so, yes, it seems as if the Lord was preparing in advance to let me know that even though the bad news, the difficult news was going to come, he will make a way where there's no way. Listen, it doesn't matter what you're going through, God will make a way for you. Can we put our hands together for the king? Amen. He's worthy. And, and so, the resurrection is coming. Hold on. And so the Bible tells us in John 20 and verse 1, the Bible says, early on the first day of the week, while it was so dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And she went running to Peter and John saying, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Peter and John went running to the tomb and they found the tomb to be empty except the burial cloth. And so they left and they went home disappointed. But Mary stayed behind, crying. She looked again into the tomb, and this time she saw two angels in the tomb. And why are you crying? They asked her. And she said, I want to know where my Lord is. The Bible says Mary turned, and you know, she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize Jesus because she, she thought that was, that was a gardener. And so Mary said, can you tell me where they've carried him so that I can just go and get him? And Jesus turned to her and said, Mary. And at that point in time, the Bible says Mary's eyes were open. Then she cried out in the Aramaic language, Rabboni, Rabboni, which simply means teacher. On this resurrection day, 
May God open your eyes to see your risen Savior. Amen. Because he lives, you can face tomorrow. And so Jesus said to her in John 20 and 17, Jesus do, said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm returning to your Father and my Father, to my God and your God. And so Mary went to the disciples with the good news. I have seen the Lord. Jesus is risen. Jesus is alive. Now, question, what, what is the, why is the resurrection so, so important? Let me give you five quick reasons as we bring things to a close. Number one, the resurrection establishes the truthfulness of Jesus. Remember, Jesus told the disciples that he was going to be crucified and that he was going to rise again on the third day. And that's exactly what happened. And this means that every word spoken by Jesus is true. You can count on Jesus. If you count on Jesus, you will never be disappointed. Amen? Second, the resurrection establishes the fact that Jesus is God. That Jesus has power over life and over death. And that this God is with us. If Jesus is with us, who can be against us? Third, the resurrection gives the assurance of eternal life that we have hope beyond the grave. You know, Paul said to the Corinthian church, if only in this world we have hope, then we of all men are the most miserable. But the fact that Jesus rose again tells us that we have hope beyond the grave. If you believe you have hope this morning, will you put your hands together for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Amen? Fourth, the resurrection made possible the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the establishment of the church. Where would you and I be without the church today? It's all because of the resurrection. And finally, the resurrection gives us hope to live in victory. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. The Bible says, when he rose up and went to heaven, he took a place at the right hand of God. And at this very point in time, Jesus is interceding. He's praying for you and I. Church, this is why we celebrate Easter. The blood of Jesus has cleansed us from every sin. We have been reconciled with our Heavenly Father. The Spirit of God lives in us. We are healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been made more than conquerors. Jesus is alive, and because he lives, we can face tomorrow. On this Easter day, may God cause his face to shine upon you. May the favor of God rest upon you. May the same power that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, which is alive in you, Resurrect every dead thing in your life to the glory of the living God. May God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, show himself strong on your behalf. If you believe it, put your hands together for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. May the worship team come forth as we transition uh, to bring things to a close. Our God is an awesome God. What a mighty God we serve. And so I want to just assure you this morning that the same God, who rose up Jesus Christ from the dead, raised him from the dead, is the same God who is alive and at work in you this morning. You are not a destitute person. You are a child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You might feel crucified because of your situation, but listen, your resurrection is definitely on the way. May God bless you. May God favor you. May God cause his face to shine upon you as you transition into a holy communion.